Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Straight Talk. Welcome to Straight Talk Live, both in the audience, and what a pleasure to have a live audience again, and also on the streaming. We're delighted you could be here. My name's Andrew Charlton, and we're today going to go in-depth into Ryanair. But before we do that, as we always do at Straight Talk, I'm going to ask the Director-General of Eurocontrol, Mr Raymond Brennan, if he'd give us a market update. Raymond. Thank you, Andrew, and welcome to the Ryanair team to Eurocontrol. You're very welcome here this afternoon. So we're going to quickly have a look at where we are at this part time of the year uh, and where we're going to. So basically, we're just out of the pandemic, which was a trauma for aviation. And we've never seen anything like this. A 60% decline in world total passenger traffic. Worse than in the financial crisis or in the SARS or anything that we've ever seen before. So really, we've never seen anything like this. And we've done very well to recover as well as we have. Interesting that we have Ryanair here today is we're looking at the IATA study that was revealed in Istanbul a number of weeks ago. But what's really interesting to see is that they now have 72% commonality of routes with what we call the legacy carriers. So when we say the lines are blurred in Europe, there's a lot of interaction and there's a lot of similar routes between low cost and um, what we call the legacy carriers. So this has changed in the last number of years. Reiner very quickly got out of the traps after the COVID. And I'm sure that Michael and the team will explain to you how that happened today. But they very quickly moved and um, increased to about 10% over their 2019 figures. And this was really spectacular to get back flying so fast. Others struggled. And when you look at the Ryanair group, and you're very welcome again today, the major airline in Europe, uh, and really, you know, you're operating three different aircraft types and a lot's on orders, and I'm sure Michael and the team will fill you in on all of that today. But it's really a big success story in 2022. And, you know, also when we look at the airspace situation, one of the things I just want to mention to you is that air, some air, um, air countries are actually increasing. And this has been brought about by the fact that we've had to close Russian um, airspace due to the Russian aggression against Ukraine, close Belarus. So air, airspace to the north is not available and to the south in Romania and Bulgaria is much busier than before. And this, of course, has caused delays. Ryanair is the number one contributor for route charges. 713 million paid up to uh, the end of October. And you can see there all the various airlines. But it's interesting when you look at the countries. You know, it contributes the most to France, Italy, Spain, UK and Germany. So this is a really important contributor to the um, network. This summer was really difficult. And when we look at, you know, the year to date, we achieved a 72% arrival punctuality rate which was still 6% down on 2019. Now, that's not great from our point of view because traffic was less. But the reality is we had less airspace. So all in all, it wasn't too bad, given that it was a startup, given that we had airports and all of that. Uh, we're not happy with it, but it could have been worse. And I think that's the message. In terms of non-operated schedules or what the public like to call cancellations, Reiner had the lowest rate in the system. Um, others were higher and this caused a lot of grief to passengers throughout the, um, throughout the summer. I think it's also worthwhile mentioning that in other sectors have had a boom. Cargo is booming. It's about 13% up on 2019. And really it's going very, very well for all the majors like KLM, Lufthansa, IAG at the moment. And it's really good at the moment. So basically to sum up, where are we right now? Well, we're down 16% on um, traffic globally, down 14% in Europe, passengers are down 14% on 2019, and we're still expecting a full recovery by 2024. So basically, the outlook from, from our point of view is very simple. First of all, complication number one, we've got the Ukraine crisis. We've got the invasion by the Russians. Here we have airspace at the south of Poland, been blocked off every day, numerous military exercises often announced at short notice and this is giving us a little bit of grief and this will continue, we believe, into next summer. You know, we have Ukraine as a member state of Europe control and we have full solidarity and only recently we approved a package of measures to help the air navigation service provider in, in Ukraine. 
So really, we've experienced so many different shocks in the system that's leading us towards kind of um, inflate, uh, deflationary pressures and also the possibility of a recession. And when you look at the outcome for economic growth, and you know, I'm not sure who believes all this, but the reality is inflation in Belgium at the moment is running at about 10%. All over Europe, it's high. Uh, growth is kind of predicted in the region of 2 to 3%. I'm not sure if it'll happen, but we're hoping that inflation will decline next year. So the, the reality is that we're faced with basically, you know, two things that are causing us as kind of like roadblocks to growth. The Russian aggression in Ukraine and supply chain disruptions, which are causing problems with delivery of aircraft. And I'm sure the Reiner team will discuss that with you later. I also want to mention to you is that Russian airspace is closed for European carriers, but it's not closed for Chinese carriers. And every day they fly cargo into Europe, into Liège and into Antwerp. And when the passenger market opens, this will likely increase. So the European legacy carriers are facing a competitive disadvantage due to this situation. So we now face significant risks of a recession. Everybody's talking about it. But what's interesting is it's not coming through in the travel industry at the moment. And I'd be interested in Michael's views on this. One other complication that we have, of course, is the disparity in exchange rates between the US dollar and the euro. This has changed significantly. You know, dollar is where all the uh, fuel is denominated. Then you buy aircraft largely in dollars. And of course, you know, it leads to a kind of an imbalance of travel across the North Atlantic. Americans find Europe cheap, but we don't find it the other way around. And, you know, the jet fuel is up and down. I mean, a lot of them are hedged with, with jet fuel. There's a widening gap between the price of crude and jet fuel due to refinery capacity, which is also an issue going forward. So a lot of challenges for 2023 ahead. So just to kind of summarise where we are. Basically, we are looking at... A a good winter, in my view. Cautious optimism. You know, the winter season capacity remains at 85%. Very good bookings, and I'm sure Reiner will confirm this, for December. And also for parts of quarter one, 2023, particularly towards the midterm break and coming up towards Easter. But the reality is there is no sign of China reopening. So we're down about 33% on long haul heading into China. And the other thing from the outlook point of view is there will still be deliveries of new aircraft. And all of these will be newer aircraft that will contribute to sustainability. We've agreed on the Corsia. We've agreed on the reduction of emissions and the Fit for 55. All of this is important. And we've got to deliver sustainability in our industry. But, you know, in the next 20 years, 95% of the fleet will be replaced with newer generation engines, which will drop CO2 by about 20%. But we realise that's not enough and we've a plan in place to deal with, with that. So for basically traffic in Europe, the situation is that we're still predicting a 2 to 3% growth over the next number of years up to 2025. You can see this from the Reiner figures, uh, but you know, a minimum of 2% and probably a maximum of about 3%. So consistent growth is where, is where, is where we're at. So to really wrap it up, we think next summer there's going to be more aircraft in the system. Uh, we're still worried about airspace closures in the Ukraine and military exercises. We really have to get away from the strike situation, particularly in France, and we are working with the Commission to try and protect overflights. It's really important. Now, airports is also an issue which I'll deal with in a moment, and of course, working with the network manager. I want to mention to all everybody in Europe something that's really important is there's a new entry exit system which starts in May 2023 and the question is are we ready to introduce this at the start of the summer season so we're currently talking to the commission and we're currently talking to the airlines and airports about this if this goes well it'll be great if it doesn't it's going to lead to long queues so we've got to keep our eye on this new system that starts in May 2023 and beyond 2023 we still think the Ukraine situation is uncertain. We're not seeing any sign of any movements for peace or anything there. So I think you'll see more of the same for the next number of years. And of course, this European single sky has gone nowhere so far. And we need to see improvements there. There's a 10% sustainability dividend there. So enjoy... Uh, Michael and the Reiner team, um, Eddie and Neil, you're welcome here to Eurocontrol this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Am. It's time to meet the team. Uh, from my left, uh, your right, I think, Eddie Wilson, who is the CEO of the airline. Uh, Michael O'Leary, you might have heard of him. Uh, he's the CEO of the group. And then Neil McMahon, who is the COO, the Chief Operating Officer. All that data we've had, 
both on the video and, and Eamon's presentation. I'm going to start with you, Neil. You, got, you get about 500 aircraft out a day. Yep. How the hell do you do that? With great difficulty, that's underappreciated and underloved <laughs> by the two people, people sitting beside me. Um, I think you could say that a little louder. Yeah. <laughs> uh, paid next. We, <laughs> we, uh, look, we've been doing the same thing over and over for the last 25, 30 years. We have uh, 90 bases across Europe. Every morning we have 10,000 cabin crew, 5,000 pilots, engineers, ground ops, all doing the same exact processes to get the aircraft out. So they work terrifically hard day after day, uh, all calling in, dialing in at nine o'clock on, on, uh, on every single day to tell us what went out, what went out on time. So it's the rinse and repeat. We keep things very, very simple, 25 minute turnarounds and go again uh, every day after day. So you must have quite a large what's the word I want, cohort of people who, whose only job is to make sure that that keeps running. Yes, the entire operations team. That's, your, your so it team. is the, the ops team, all we do all day is worry about punctuality. Get right. the aircraft out on time, and when an aircraft has a technical issue, get it fixed as quickly as possible and keep the passengers moving. And that's allowed us, as Eamon mentioned earlier, to keep the, the cancellations down. So while there was disruption this, this summer due to uh, ATC delays, we kept the cancellations, we kept passengers going, uh, and kept their flights uh, as best we could on time. Wow. So, Michael, one of the things that Ryan is really famous for, in fact, is exactly that, on-time performance and, and constant operations. Do you think, do you think that that's going to top out at some point? Is there, is there a limit to any of that? I don't think so. I mean, you know, we see uh, this year we expect to carry about 168 million passengers. We have a plan over the next four years to grow to 100 and 225 million passengers. And then we're coming up with a plan for the following five years to keep that growth going. I think what's critical to that, though, uh, and to the punctuality is the people in this room and in the wider organization. I mean, one of the big challenges we face uh, this summer, and I think for the next two or three summers, is how uh, we reform or bring about some reform of European uh, ATC system which is fundamentally broken. Uh, I think the team in Eurocontrol has done a, a heroic job this summer, and I want to compliment everybody in Eurocontrol. You know, it is underappreciated how difficult it has been with NATO blocking up the skies over uh, um, Poland and the, some of Central and Eastern Europe, with Russia being closed and lots of flights being diverted down. You know, Eurocontrol has demonstrated, and the people in this room and in this organiza organization have demonstrated remarkable flexibility in keeping uh, us flying. But we have much more to do. Uh, it infuriates me, certainly, that uh, you know, after 21 years of the single European Sky project, no progress has been made whatsoever. Uh, but Eurocontrol and the individual airlines working closely together are keeping the system going, but there's much more we can do, I think, to improve punctuality in the next few years. Two simple reforms we would like to see is during uh, national strikes, you protect the overflights. The overflights under EU law should be protected. And we would uh, very much, and we're calling, uh, particularly wearing my A4E hat, calling on the European Union to separate the upper airspace and give that to Eurocontrol. Make that a Eurocontrol competence so that you keep the upper airspace functioning while all the, uh, our French friends are, are having their recreational strikes every Friday and Tuesday uh, during the summer peak. Yeah, and in, um, I'll come to more complex questions in a moment, perhaps, but Eamon mentioned that you are the largest single contributor to European air traffic control and to other charges. Do you get value for money? Do we get value for money? Uh, no. I mean, I think uh, we would be very happy to pay what we currently pay if we didn't, if, you know, this year 24% of our flights this summer weren't, uh, didn't, weren't, delayed because of ATC slots and delays. Now, that's not a Eurocontrol failure. It's an individual ATM provider failure, but much more uh, Eurocontrol and the services we pay for to the various national ATCs should be, we shouldn't have to pay if our flights are delayed for, I don't know, take a figure, more than 15 minutes, more than an hour. We should have a right of recovery. We have to pay uh, EU 261 compensation on our passengers when we suffer, and during the summer we suffered horrendous ATC, not just an ATC delay, but knock-on delays as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we should have a right of recovery against the national uh, ATM providers, but we don't. So, uh, look. Do you we, think the same about airports, that you should have a right of recovery? 
I mean, airports is a different conversation. Yeah, you know, we, a lot of it, I don't want to get into airports here today. I'd rather focus on what we can do better working with Eurocontrol and with the ANSPs over the next summer or two because I think that's where most of the flight savings, most of the fuel savings and most of the environmental or the emission reduction will come from. Right, so you, but you, to come back a little bit, you still see there's significant growth in the European No market. question. I mean, look, the greatest, I, I have never, uh, we are at probably the most optimistic, apart from in Belgium or in Brussels, this is the most optimistic time I have seen in the air travel for the last 25 years. Really? Everybody's been locked down for two years. You go around per the periphery of Europe, Eastern Europe, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece. Everybody's going back flying. Tourism is getting back. Hotels are filling up again. The beach is filling up again. Everything's getting moving again. And I've never seen such a sense of optimism. Uh, and then you come to Brussels and you meet a couple of MEPs and bureaucrats and you just, they suck the optimism out. You, 2050 and SAFs and... Ugh. You know, People have had been denied flying for two years. And I think, you know, we've seen what the green future looks like. You know, we're all locked up at home in our dungeons and nobody's able to fly. People don't want it. They want to be able to fly. Flying, we're going to have to pay our, the environmental cost of flying. But that environmental cost shouldn't be, all, as it is at the moment, all levied on short-haul flights around Europe. It is a scandal uh, and it is a disgrace that the European Union exempts long-haul flights from paying their fair share of environmental taxes. Despite Why do you think the fact they do that? that? It accounts for 6% of the traffic, but 55% of the emissions. Yeah, indeed. It is a scandal that those rich uh, people are not paying their fair share. And it is equally a scandal that, you know, most notably the Dutch, uh, who ha I think have a commissioner over here who's a great man for telling the rest of Europe what we should do. Uh, the Dutch have an exempt transfer. The transfer traffic doesn't pay its environmental. Taking two flights to get to your destination instead of one, and you're completely exempt from your fair share of environmental taxes. So there's much more that needs to be done to reform environmental taxation. But I have never been more optimistic. I think the people of Europe have, have it, had a taste of what not flying looks like for two years, and we're never going back there. Right. So, Eddie, as you go around the network, as Michael was just saying, to Greece, to, to Italy, whatever, are you, are you agreeing that there's this amazing yeah. sense of optimism? I mean, it's hard to see the white space when you look at uh, where we are on the, the route map. But, you know, in Italy, we put in an extra 25 aircraft just wow. straight after COVID. We see the you know, the sort of white spaces that are around in places like Portugal, in uh, Scandinavia, where those, uh, you know, national carriers or previous national carriers are either bankrupt or in retreat. And you include Italy in that. Spain as well has recovered. UK has recovered. You've had a long line of airports that now, once the carousel stopped uh, during COVID and it began to start again, people realized who's going to fill the space? Who's going to fill, uh, who's going to fill my airports? We saw that most notably in places like Italy, you know, most of those airports are privately owned and they realized that they didn't get Ryanair back to pre-COVID levels. And not only that, we actually did that even more. We put in about an extra 25% of aircraft into Italy. And we see that all the time. I mean, the airports that are actually going to suffer from this or the countries that are going to suffer are those that have the same old way of looking at things, which is we're gonna put up prices and we want more traffic. And that's simply not going to happen when you're able to do long-term deals, particularly as we talked about the aircraft order, we're gonna to grow to 225 million passengers within the next four years. We're currently at 168 million passengers for this year. And those airports that are efficient, that leverage their uh, retail opportunities, uh, parking, et cetera, are the ones that are going to win. And a lot of airports, particularly what we would call, you know, secondary primary airports, just are not at the races in terms of recovering their traffic, their incentives don't work, and they've gone back to the, the old ways of just putting prices up, and there's nobody else to fill that space. So one of the things that fascinates me about that, I mean, two questions, I suppose. First, you don't think that the recession is going to hit this optimism head on? or You think tourism somehow or other is going to go through the recession without, without feeling it? Yeah, but like what you see here is, I mean, like this, you know, recession is different this time round, I suppose, because mm. we've got relatively full employment um, okay. and people have got uh, savings as well. But if you look at, say, short haul, short haul market, which we're in, that's actually got smaller, you know, over the last, um, certainly over the last 12 months. You look at what happened in Germany this summer, you had 25% reductions in capacity, which airfare is rising. But what you've got with Ryanair is the lowest cost operator with the lowest fares. Yeah. So people in a recession 
whether it's air travel, whether it's supermarkets, whether it's cars, they migrate to the lowest cost operator. And in our situation, you've got the most modern aircraft, it goes on time, cheapest prices. Once you make that change, you're never ever going to go back to be paying three or four times the prices that you've done previously. You make it sound so easy. The, the, you, you, you've, you, you just said that we're, you're going to go from, I've probably got the number, you're going to add about another 60 million passengers, you think, in, the next, yep. in, your, in your next period. The, the CEO of United Airlines in the US two, three weeks ago said that he thinks low-cost carriers are a Ponzi scheme and that they need to depend on new traffic, as all, <laughs> new traffic all the time. They need, and that's the only way they can pay down their debt. I'm, I'm noticing from the way you're laughing that perhaps you don't agree with Mr Kirby. Would, would that be right? Just what, the, I mean, A is rich from coming from a guy whose airline has been in and out of Chapter 11, 11 bankruptcy not once but twice. Okay. Uh, all of the major US airlines have been in and out of Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Uh, and the, I think the best answer to that question, uh, or the remarkable statement that low, low cost carriers are a Ponzi scheme is Southwest Airlines, mm. which yeah. is the only major airline in the US that hasn't been in and out of Chapter 11 uh, bankruptcy, didn't shaft its labour contracts and didn't shaft its pension schemes. Um, so I think a little bit of humility coming from the uh, United <laughs> Airlines would, be, would not go amiss. You know, there are flaky carriers out there. Um, there are flaky low, low fare carriers out there that will not survive or have not survived. Um, you know, Norwegian comes to mind, it imploded. Uh, there are flaky high fare carriers out there. Sabina you know, is the, uh, the one, the gift that keeps, uh, kept on giving 75 years, never made any money. Uh, Alitalia, I think, is on its 74th year of never having made any money. Sorry, it's called ITA now. So there's lots of flaky airlines that are bankrupt out there. Now, no one would call uh, Ryanair is not a Ponzi scheme. Uh, we're a very profitable airline. We have the strongest balance sheet in the industry, and we have the lowest costs in Europe. Uh, and I think that, so we demonstrate well-run airlines have a future, uh, it's very important that we continue to grow strongly because if we don't keep growing in Europe, everybody else is going to get screwed by Lufthansa, Air France, uh, BA. I mean, I came down in the lift here in Eurocontrol to see a, 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 an ad, which I'm sure you've all seen in the building. Carsten Spohr telling the world that, you know, the future... On, in the, I had to take a photograph of this <laughs> thing. We're going to be sending it to my advertising department. He said, flight prices will never return to wherever pre-pandemic. The industry needs higher prices to finance investment and be more resilient to shocks. Well, I hope he tells his customers that because Ryanair is not going to be going with higher prices. We're going to keep Lufthansa and the others honest. And I think we will continue to be very profitable selling the lowest airfares in Europe. But will there be other casualties? Yes. Will there be further consolidation in Europe? Yes, there will. But, you know, listening to bullshit from air, airline CEOs in the US who have been in and out of Chapter 11 uh, more times than I've been in and out of expensive restaurants wouldn't pay too much attention. Which, which would be quite a few. No. As a, if, if one tracks about <laughs> Mac D's for me. Now, now. Well, obviously, expensive is a relative term, isn't it? Uh, one of the things Eamon said, though, on that point, uh, was that there is increasingly an overlap between the routes you operate and the routes the legacy carriers operate. Is, d do you see the competition now increasingly being with the legacy carriers or do you still see the competition being with the other low-cost carriers? I mean, I think the difference when you look at our evolution um, over the last number of crises is that we now have the, um, the frequency on a lot of those routes. So, um, you know, on a lot of city pairs where we have grown, hmm. um, where we previously might have been on two or three times a week, and they look back to 2008, and now, you know, you might have had a daily or a twice daily service. That's reversed in a lot of city pairs, whereby we're on three, four times a day now. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that just has a real yeah, um, issue or in, in terms of uh, uh, people's expectations and what prices are. And we can see that a lot of the times where new entrants come on and uh, we're pretty much sold out and they're discounting for the last number of seats, you know, to try, and, to try and push load factor because increasingly as well, because of Ryanair's network of 88 bases, we're generally at both ends of those routes. We've got better timetables and we've got better awareness in both sides of those markets. Well, indeed, but, but frequency is actually a really major competitive tool, isn't it? I mean, yeah. if you only fly once a day, you're nothing compared to a carrier that flies four or five times a day to the same, same route. So... As that overlap grows, I guess there's really only one question, which is, Neil, are you ready to set up a Heathrow base yet? Uh, no, no. <laughs> uh, 
Look, I think uh, if, you look at, if you look at a place like Heathrow, they're what? They're, increased, they're looking to increase the price again. It's the most expensive uh, airport in Europe. 50%. Looking to increase it by 50%. Like, it's absolutely nuts. Um, I think the big difference this year um, with, the, with Heathrow and the security issues they had is the number of passengers that actually migrated to Stansted. So they went up to Stansted, people would have thought, particularly families, would have gone on holidays, their, their flight was cancelled in Heathrow, went up to Stansted and realised, actually, this is a great airport, it's easy to get on the train, you get, your, you get there, your flight goes on time, and you go on holidays. Mm. So we're seeing a huge number of, uh, uh, of passengers that have migrated. So we've no interest in going to Heathrow with, with the colossally high prices, where you can't do a 25-minute turnaround. Uh, and you can't get the aircraft utilization. So that's probably one of the few airports where we will never, we will never be and we'll never base an aircraft. So there'll always be that little bit in the middle where there's no overlap, you think, coming into and out of Heathrow. Yeah, exactly. Are there any other airports you hate like that? You hate like Heathrow? Paris Charles, Charles de Gaulle comes to mind as well. Orly. Uh, uh, Orly. Like in Paris Charles de Gaulle, there's a, the, the taxi time from the runways is about an hour. Mm. Our average flight is, is less than two hours. So the amount of time we would lose the utilization of the airplane. Like what makes Ryanair work and what makes us so good is that we get the aircraft up and down over six times a day, every single one. Uh, and that, that aircraft utilization allows us to bring more passengers at lower fares and, and grow the business. If we started going into, you know, Orly, Charles de Gaulle, Heathrow, you wouldn't get that aircraft utilization. You'd get your costs would go up, your fares would have to rise, and you wouldn't be able to grow as well. So we, we're much happier in Bergamo, in Stansted, in Charlois, uh, where we can grow and use uh, and grow efficiently. Right. But there's also this myth about. Um, connectivity out of some of those major airports. I mean, Dublin has more short-haul connections than Heathrow, you know, throughout your, you know. Um, Delivered but you by have you. This Dublin, Dublin Airport. Right? Delivered and, by you. Yeah, well, we, we have about 60% of the market. There, yeah, you know? yeah, But yeah. like that amount of connections that are on short-haul, I mean, we overlap with our Lingus out there, there's nobody else, but more short-haul connections out of Dublin than Heathrow. But, but on that point, though, do, I mean, one of the great traditional things about the traditional industry was the interline system. I could fly and then I could transfer to use those connectivity points that you offer. You're not looking at offering interline or anything like that? No. no. Why not? I mean, it's, it's, it's probably, it's more to do with operational efficiency. You've got to have different infrastructure at the airport. Keep it simple. Um, you know, the most successful airports that we have had are ones that have grown with us. You know, you take places like Bergamo, that has grown from a small a cargo airport back in 2003 to Italy's third largest airport now. Mm. You know, and the idea that you'd put infrastructure in to connect with, I don't know who you connect with, there's no need to connect with us out of Italy, because we fly everywhere else out of Italy, particularly domestically. You know? but, but I so, could fly so into Bergamo on, on you and then transfer onto another flight on you and go from A to C, if you like. Yeah, but again, you, um, you are, what we're going to do is we're going to continue to grow and proliferate those point-to-point -point connections because people don't want to take two flights. They want to take one flight. Mm. You know, uh, people don't have the time for it, particularly like intra-European connections, you know, went out with the Indians, you know, like it's, uh, it's, not, um, uh, it's not something that anyone is growing within Europe and anyone who is, it's getting much smaller. Right. I think you look at the experience of summer two at European airports, like ship hall was a complete shambles. Mm. Mm. I mean, transfers completely broke down. Heathrow, yeah. transfers completely broke down at almost every hub airport in Europe this year. Yeah. I mean, there's billions of bags that are sitting in warehouses where transfers completely failed. It is, and also, there's an environmental cost to transfers. Mm. You're taking two flights to get to your destination. When flying with Ryanair, we'll get you there directly to every regional airport across Europe, Western Europe, Eastern Europe. You don't need to be transferring through these god-awful um, uh, hub airports, which are routinely delayed, uh, lose your bag, um, and you pay twice and three times the airfare. It is a much more environmentally friendly and environmentally sustainable way to fly low cost, point to point, um, and avoid these um, expensive uh, and inefficient uh, hub airports. Sorry. I, yeah, and, and the difference between us and obviously some of the legacy guys, we've got 90 bases across Europe. So we've got much more opportunities for connections. Like, mm. you know, the kind of legacy was you had one hub with all the airplanes and everyone had to get there to go somewhere else. 
We have 2,300 routes. We have more, we double, over double the routes of anybody else in the world. Well, indeed. I mean, the legacy boys are stuck with the old regulatory structure, aren't they, of national bases and all those things. You're able to put a base in literally anywhere in Europe. Hmm. Have you plans to put in bases outside of Europe? We have yeah. bases in Morocco. Yeah. Morocco, I okay. guess. Yeah, well. so we were flying to a number of countries outside of Europe. Morocco, Israel, Jordan. We're talking to the Egyptians, the Libyans. Uh, we were uh, getting quite large in Ukraine before Putin uh, yep. engaged, you know, illegally invaded the place. Do you think it we was would be the first airline you, Michael, back or? into Ukraine when we're told it's safe to do so? Uh, we've, we're big believers in the future of Ukraine. You know, we're yeah. the largest airline in Poland, we're the largest airline in Romania, most of the Central and Eastern European countries. And I think Ukraine has a very bright future. Certainly aviation, Ukraine has a very bright future because the way they're going to have to rebuild that economy well, will be fly first because the roads and the bridges are all blown up. Well, but I mean, at which point you may have to ask yourself, are you interested in cargo as well? To nope. get into? No. no interest in cargo? cargo no. Post. Nope. no. Even if you could just get a container of cargo off and back on in 20 minutes? No. Ev every it time we look at it. Don't hold back, don't hold back. <laughs> what do we actually every do? time we look at this, yeah. you know, every time we look at this, we did a... You know, we got a study done uh, about two or three years ago yeah. from a group of PhDs or from Cambridge, whatever. But they, that was a while. Mistake. I mean, what actually happened was that, um, uh, is that, uh, as Michael says, it will invariably interfere with turnarounds. I mean, mm -hmm. in Ryanair, it's operations first, commercial second, because, you know, operations are the commercial uh, backbone of the airline. You've got to keep to the 25 minute turnaround. Everything is tightly kept together to do with whether it's the, uh, the scheduling, the airports, getting people back to base, not getting people into the next day, the number of crews per aircraft, it all sort of is bound in in the same, in the same model. And anything that interferes with that, we've got to, uh, we've got to approach with really, really great caution because right. it risks upsetting all those inter, uh, interoperabilities. So, Neil, no pressure on you then at all? No, not for cargo, no. no. no, no. <laughs> I, didn't mean, I didn't mean for cargo, I meant mean for ops more generally. All, that inter, you know, all those interdependencies that, that just all depend on the ops going absolutely smoothly. Yeah, there's, there's, look, it's, it's a difficult uh, operation, but we keep it really, really simple. Like, it's huge, it's enormous. Every day we do, you know, 3,000 flights a day in the summer, half a million passengers every single day. So we have lots of things that can go wrong. This summer, uh, as Michael mentioned, ATC delayed about 25% oh. of flights. Like we had 22 million passengers delayed due to ATC this year. Yeah. 22 million. Like it's enormous numbers. Uh, and, and something has to be done. And in fairness, the guys here, um, uh, and I deal a lot with the network manager with Jacopo, doing a terrific job trying to keep it all together. But it's a complete mess when it goes wrong. Like we had a day in, uh, on the 28th, 29th of September where nine French air traffic controllers went on strike. Yeah. Nine. Mm. And we had 100,000 passengers delayed that day. Yeah, but the weather was rather pleasant, as I remember. The weather, it was. The weather was but, the, but we've had it. We had a strike two weeks before. We had notice. We told passengers, your, your flight is cancelled. Uh, and they didn't come to the airport. On the 28th, 29th of September, Everyone was in the airport looking out, going, where's my airplane? Why can't I go? The airplane was there, the pilots were there, the cabin crew were there. And we said, sorry, there's somebody in, uh, in France that's not gone to work. Who's not there? Fly. And the most difficult thing about that day was, is that French don't protect overflights. Mm. So you've got a passenger sitting in London, in Stansted, going to Madrid. And we say, I'm really sorry, your flight's cancelled because someone in France is on strike. Like, that doesn't compute to people. People can't yeah. understand it. Yeah. They just assume that it must be a Ryanair thing. Yeah. So if we achieve one thing next year, is we have to get overflights protected. Right. But, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, actually, for all those baggage problems and all the chaos at the airports, all the passengers seem to blame the airport. So I'm interested that on ATC the blame, the delays, they seem to blame the, uh, the airlines themselves. Mm. But leave that aside for a minute. What are we doing about ATC delays? I mean... There's the overflights and putting upper upper airspace into one group and getting Euro control to manage it. But as Eamon mentioned in his tape, and, and I think Michael, you in the video as well, we've been having a go at single European sky for 25 years now, grosso modo. We don't get it. We can't get it. Surely Ryanair, as the largest contributor and an airline that flies to every European state, must have some leverage to get governments to do something. 
to Michael. Yeah. Have you? Well, I mean, we can Eddie. do. We um, we've been banging that drum um, for for many many years. I mean, but um, uh, again, you've got these things are rooted in sort of uh, national politics as well, and they're not going to happen. Um, you know, you're not going to get a situation. I think where you're going to have uh, national governments of their own volition, you know, give away the, um, or get together with other countries to give away the right to their own um, airspace. And I think it's incumbent upon the, the commission, I suppose, to promote that overflights. Because, you know, one of the fundamental cornerstones of the European Union is freedom of movement. And, mm. you know, this idea that people, you know, flying, as Neil says, they're from London to Madrid, been told that it's because of French uh, air traffic controllers, and in that case, a very small number. Like, it's, it, you know, it, it, it's intolerable, you know? Mm. And the amount of fuel that is wasted with aircraft sitting on the ground, with engines idling, um, you know, we've got to finally do something about this um, because governments won't do it themselves. Single European skies has not really worked. We need to get, we need some action now. You know, let's get overflights in for next summer. That, at least if you've got national strikes, will not inconvenience people who, do, who have no part in that whatsoever. Do you... I, I, oh, sorry, sorry. Just, just on the overflights, like, you know, we're not trying to break new ground here or invent, reinvent something that's not there. Italy has overflights. Yeah. UK has overflights. Germany has overflights. This exists. It's French don't, don't, uh, don't apply it. So we just have to... And, and given this, the location of France and mm -hmm. literally at the axis of Europe mm -hmm. uh, uh, for overflights, that, that has to be uh, come through. But, like, we've been fighting with governments for 20 years to try to get ATC, certainly for the last 10 years, to try to reform ATC. Uh, made very little progress. We've, we're working very closely with Eurocontrol uh, to try to get Eurocontrol uh, have a more prominent uh, position and be able to manage more of European airspace uh, and be able to deliver improvements because this is where it's going to happen. Like if, mm. if it's going to be improvements, well, it's going to be through the Commission mm. in this room. Is it? Is it? I mean... Is there an opportunity for Ryanair to just go it alone? I mean, you've got the technology on board those brand new aeroplanes to self-separate to within a couple of centimetres. Is there any... Why, why are the airlines determined to do this collectively? It's as if we want mutual <laughs> mediocrity instead of one airline saying, you know what, I want, I want quality. Is there any opportunity, do you think? I mean, will fortune favour the brave in that way? I look, the system isn't set up to do that. We have to fly, we, we, we file our flight plans. Flight plans have to be approved by national ATCs and by Eurocontrol. I don't understand the technical. I mean, this is not just Ryanair. The one area where all of Europe's airlines agree under A4E is the need for urgent reform of ATC. Mm. Uh, the single European skies has been a 21 year shambles. It has been an abject and utter failure. They've, it's been so bad, spectacularly bad, that they've relaunched it with a single European sky 2. SES was such a shambles, we're going to have a second one. It's like having the sequel to the first horror <laughs> movie. <laughs> a second um, horror film. Abandon it. It's a waste of time. It is never going to get uh, delivered. Uh, they're going to spend the next 21 years talking about it, and nothing will happen. We, there is some prospect, I think, of having much more practical solutions. A, you know, we should, Europe has a duty to protect the freedom of movement under the Treaty of Rome. Freedom of movement means freedom of movement by rail, sea, but also by sky protect the overflights. You know, if you could protect the overflights, it doesn't would take away somebody's right to strike. Strike away. Mm -hmm. But the national citizenry takes the hit if the French want to have a recreational strike on Fridays or Sundays during the summer. Let the French take the day. But you can't be expecting the Irish, the Spanish, the Italians, the Germans, who are just doing uh, innocently overflying France to take all the hits. And that's what happens at the moment. The French, who are very clever, protect their domestic flights with minimum services, and everybody else's flights get cancelled. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, so I think we should abandon uh, SES. It's a shambles. It's yet another uh, ma magnificent uh, Brussels failure. Push harder for protection of overflights during strikes and then separate the upper airspace and give Eurocontrol. And here's a very, Eurocontrol has a huge role to play. Give Eurocontrol control of the upper airspace. Right. Then we would, I mean, we would have a huge cost saving, you'd have flight time savings, and you'd have a huge environmental saving as well. I mean, the, the environmental, we walk, I mean, I, I, every time I come to Brussels with this, the MEPs and everybody waffling on about SAFs, all of which are very valuable, you know, but we might, SAFs might get to 2% of our fuel, set. we might account for 2% of fuel by about 2030. 
uh, we could save 10% of our fuel in 2024 if you simply reformed European ATC by separating the upper airspace and protecting overflights. Indeed, let's move to SAFs and let's move to the environment more generally because even if there's been no movement on the single European skies at a European level, and I think, to be fair, the, the European Commission is working awfully hard but is meeting a brick wall in the member states, there has been progress on the, on the SAF side, Fit for 55, the refuel EU, etc. Michael, you said earlier that you think that inevitably fares are going to have to go up to cover some of these things. Do you, do you, stamp, do you think that's right? And if so, by how much? Well, firstly, let's go back, because I wouldn't be fair to the Commission. I mean, you know, if the Commission's role here is wait to get agreement from national governments, then the Commission should be disbanded because it serves no purpose. You would never have deregulated air travel in the 1980s if you were waiting for the agreement of the French and the well, German governments true. to deregulate and liberalise air transport. The Commission and the Parliament exist to impose some change on national governments. And this is a European compass. The freedom of movement is a European compass. So let's not be fair in the Commission. The Commission has sat on its ass for 21 years. It's a Commission proposal of single European skies, and they have delivered not one inch of progress on it. Um, sorry, on to the next part of the question, which was, I've completely forgotten. Thank you, Olivia. Environment and, and the increase, the costs that that's going to I mean, look, I think it is inevitable over the next five years. I mean, I've said, you know, at the end of low fares, we're not at the end of low fares. Low fares are not over. But I do believe some of our really crazily low promotion fares, 9.99 fares, you will not see those again while oil remains up at around $100 a barrel. I think it's inevitable over the next maybe five years. Our average fare, which was 40 euros last year, may creep up towards about 50 euros over the next four or five years. I think flying is going to become a little bit more expensive. Um, but, it, you know, and some of that will be as oil prices fall, I think environmental taxes will rise. We support environmental taxes. I think it's important we say that. Mm -hmm. Our customers support environmental taxes. In fact, they pay more environmental taxes, Ryanair passengers, than any other passenger group in Europe. Uh, why? Because 100% the, of our passengers are short haul point to point. We have the smallest allocation of free ETSs. And the transatlantic, the long haul traffic, which accounts for just 6% of Europe's traffic, but 55% of our emissions, is exempt, pays diddly squat nothing. And we exempt then the most polluting flights, which is transfer flights. Mm. The minimum thing Europe should be moving on now is let's not wait for SAS. Tax on a fair basis, everybody should pay their fair contribution. They've already tried to claim it's illegal. The European courts have said, no, you can tax long haul flights on the same basis. You've just got to tax the Russians and the Chinese and the Americans the same way we tax the Europeans. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like it, don't fly here. Mm -hmm. Everybody should pay their fair share. So, so you we shouldn't be asking the Europeans, or particularly the Europeans who live in the peripheral countries, the Irish, the poor Irish, the Portuguese, the Greeks, the Spanish, the and Estonians. the Italians, to pay it all, mm -hmm. so that you can have the rich Americans and the rich Chinese exempt. That is a disgrace, and it's something that needs to be uh, transformed now. What's the best way to do that? Is it a fuel tax? I, I think there should be. No, I mean, I, I see no reason why we don't have uh, either an environmental tax, either by mileage or on or fuel uplifts. We do one or the other. I mean, I, every time, you know, and I love Karsten and Lufthansa dearly, but he keeps going on about leakage, carbon leakage, like it was the end of civilization as we know it, <coughs> because somebody might move through Istanbul instead of through Frankfurt. Um, you, know, you tax, if you're going through Istanbul, you should pay your ETS as well. Yeah. Uh, but there is absolutely no argument for exempting long-haul flights and asking, in many cases, the poorest Europeans, the people who are the most price-sensitive, families going on holidays, well-deserved short haul holidays, to pay all of the environmental taxes. And that's what's happening at the moment. Last year, Ryanair passengers paid 640 million euros in environmental taxes. The average, our average fare was 40 euros. Our average environmental tax per passenger was 4 euros 50. Our passengers pay more environmental taxes than Lufthansa's passengers, Air France passengers, anybody other passengers in Europe. And it is time for this uh, regressive taxation to end. Everybody should pay their fair share. Do, do you think that the tax will have an impact on the passenger volumes? I mean, that's the classic model. Prices no. go up, demand comes down. The passenger volumes are rising. We're growing far. We're growing like gangbusters. Uh, because you know, we have so much, we're so much lower cost and lower price than everybody else. So that's not going to work. But it is indefensible that people paying the highest airfares, which is long-haul passengers, are exempt from a fair share of environmental taxes. Is SAFs the answer? It's one. I mean, look, we all are committed to getting to zero uh, carbon by 2050. 
you know, the more immediate ones are technological innovation. We're spending 20 billion in the next five years buying 200 new aircraft that carry 4% more seats but burn 16% less fuel and reduce, as Eddie said, emissions by 40%. Uh, we need ATC reform. With ATC reform, I mean, the figure it is given is 10. I think you'd get 20% fuel saving, flight time savings, uh, and that would have a significant bearing on it. And then SAFs have a role to play. But, you know, SAF, the supply of SAFs will be a much longer-term rollout. Hmm. But let's do the immediate things first, which is new technology, reform ATC, uh, protect the overflights, and then let's, uh, let's let all the other elements, which is SAFs, and SAFs have a role to play. We've signed up more SAF supply agreements than any other airline in Europe. We have a deal with Neste in Holland, OMV, uh, to cover uh, SAF supplies in Germany, uh, Austria, and some of the Eastern Central European countries. We're going to sign up a deal with Shell tomorrow uh, on even further supply. So we, but our supply of SAFs is less than half of 1% of our total fuel. Well, bill. indeed. I was going to ask so Neil, the volume the, is still the challenge. The 160 tonnes that you talked about in the video, how many minutes of your operations will that come? It's, it's a small number. And the problem, as Michael said, is they just can't produce enough of it. Yeah. So, yeah. so SAF, you know, is it the answer? It depends what the question is. Mm. But like we're investing, like the other thing that we're investing in, on the ground up side, we're investing hugely on, uh, on electronic equipment, you know, electric pushback tugs, electric dolly, you know, all of this stuff. But it's, it's small. The biggest thing that could be done would be airspace uh, right. uh, reform. That would deliver meaningful ATC or, or carbon reductions. But to be honest, Andrew, it's just not sexy enough. No, indeed. It's, it's invisible. The, it's invisible. So nobody, because everyone looks up in the sky and they see an airplane, they don't go, well, actually, if that, if that airplane was flying slightly more efficiently, uh, th that would, mm. would significantly make real reductions to ATC. And that's what we keep banging, down, uh, banging on the door, is they want to make real difference. Stop talking about things that are, are small, like staff in the short term. Yeah. And by the way, we're investing, uh, we're investing in Trinity College, like millions, to try to improve uh, and increase the production of SAF. We're not against it, but it's not going to deliver the short-term uh, uh, improvements that we need. Yeah, right. But I think, I think governments you know, and the Commission need to do something. It's too easy just to have mandates. You've know? mm. got to do something with the energy companies to get the prices down, to get the feedstock uh, into those plants. You know, we were looking at you know, a plant that has been by Repsol. I think they've just, uh, devel they're developing it in Cartagena in Spain at the moment. But the, the yearly output of that Ryanair, one airline in Europe, will consume that in one month. Indeed. Yeah. Mm. So you know, there's no point in just mandating it. Where do all those environmental taxes go? They invariably find their, their ways into general taxation coffers rather than finding a way to get those energy companies uh, you know, do what they've done in the States, whereby they can write off all their um, uh, taxes. So I mean, for subsidies, for, yeah, yeah, subsidies for staff in, in California. And that's what we need here. Rather right. than just doing the lazy way, we mandate this amount. Where's it going to come from? Right. What's the unintended consequences of the feedstock, et cetera? You know? Yeah, right. We also talked about technology. You've, you're in the act of buying a, a vast number of 7.3 Maxes. The CEO of Boeing at two weeks ago said, "We're not. We Boeing are not going to build another aeroplane type until at least 2035." Are you comfortable with the Maxes? Do you think that that we is, is there another aeroplane further forward? Do you think for this technology improvement to keep coming? I, mean, I think it'd be significant progress if Boeing could just build the bloody aircraft that they've contracted to build at the moment. I mean, mm. we're hoping to get 51 aircraft. We're contracted to get 51 aircraft from Boeing before the end of April. We will be lucky to get 40 aircraft by the end of June next year. And that's critical to our continuing growth next year. Mm. You know, Italy is still short capacity because of Alitalia's contraction. We need to put more aircraft into Italy. Um, Spain is still short of capacity because Norwegians kind of collapse out of the Spanish market. So there's many more of those markets uh, that we need to put more of these aircraft into. And it's vital that Boeing builds the aircraft that is contracted to build now. I don't worry about the next tech, new technology. It will come when it comes in 2030, 2040, 2050. Uh, it will get there. But I mean, we shouldn't underplay the extent to which this technology is revolutionary. The fact that we can buy a new aircraft now that has 4% more seats, nine more passengers per flight, but burns 16% less fuel and has 40% lower emissions. I mean, that is a step cha change. We call it a game changer, and it mm. is a game changer both from a, an operating cost point of view, but also from an environmental point of view. So what would it take Airbus to get you to change to A320s? Drop their prices by about 30%. Right, as easy as that. We're a one-trick pony. We will buy the cheapest aircraft we can get because that's what we do.
Right. Of course, it'd make your life a little bit harder, Neil, wouldn't it, while you had a mixed fleet? Well, we, have, we already have uh, uh, Airbus fleet. We have uh, Lauda's and all Airbus fleet. Oh, of course. Uh, and we've integrated that very well uh, into, into the operation and now has the same reliability as, as a Boeing and it's no issue. So, uh, you know, if there, was a, if there was more Airbus to come, then we could, we, could, we could successfully put that into the fleet, but it doesn't right. look likely at current prices. So we're just looking at a mere 30% reduction and we're good to go. Yeah, easy as that. The, um, earlier on, Michael, you said we, we, we started to talk about ITA in Italy. Um, I think you could probably put SAS into that category as well. The situation with Norwegian pulling out. Is that how we get to the place that, again, you were on the video saying you think there'll be four legacy carriers, for want of a better expression, and only one low-cost carrier? Is that genuinely how you see it going? Right here. But Eddie? Yeah, I mean, you look at what's, um, what's happened in terms of inter, uh, consolidation. Uh, as Michael said on the video, he, um, he's been talking about it for 10 years. We had this interruption with COVID where, you know, a lot of these, the major carriers were, were bailed out yet again. Um, and a lot no, of minor ones as well. And nothing has changed. So that is sort of, you know, uh, I, so that has interrupted that process. But like... It's inevitable what's going to happen here. I mean, like ETA has just got smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, we're now the largest carrier by some distance in Italy. You look at Portugal. Every man, woman, and child has, you know, has paid uh, uh, 350 euros for the bailout of an airline that's now smaller than when they started. And you know, it's um, you know trying to eke their way out of having a national airline. I mean, uh, taxpayers are not going to are not going to pay that again. And I think it's inevitable, like the, the, you know, the eye-watering amount of, of, uh, of money in terms of subsidies that has gone in. Mm. That, and, what, uh, and people will tire of this as well because you, know, you look at SAS again, recapitalized, chapter 11. Um, so I think the, uh, the, ca the, the well-capitalized airlines will continue to uh, encroach on, on uh, their home markets. They're getting smaller. And I think you will see those four airline groups emerge out of this, which will be ourselves, along with you know, Air France, KLM, IAG, and Lufthansa. Right. That's inevitable. But so Air France, KLM, and Lufthansa will all be doing long haul and feeders into them for long haul? Is that how you see it? Yeah, I think yeah, will they mean, compete uh, in Not unlike the States, you'll have three large connecting carriers. The States is United, uh, Delta, American. You know, I think it clearly you're going to have, in, in my view, um, but, you know, I, I hate to say, I've been wrong for 10 years, but uh, eventually I'll be right. You'll have Air France, Lufthansa, IAG. I mean, TAP is going to finish up, I think, in IAG in the next two years. Uh, ITA will finish up in either Lufthansa or Air France, whichever of them is stupid enough to volunteer <laughs> to take over what's left. Really, you look across Europe, that really only leaves the Scandinavians, and nobody wants them, but they may well put SAS and uh, Norwegian, what's left in Norwegian, together. And the two of them can kind of keep each other up like two drunks walking home from the pub. Um, leaves what's left in Europe. Uh, where's an EasyJet? EasyJet has stopped growing. Uh, have, you know, and if you can't grow in this industry, you're going backwards because your costs keep growing, but your revenue lines don't. I mean, I think EasyJet, but it's my personal view, EasyJet in the next uh, two to three years will be bought by either BA or Air France, or it'll be a combination of the two. And then Lufthansa will probably buy Wiz. And then, lo and behold, you finished up with a kind of a consolidated industry across Europe where three big airlines are dedicated to screwing the customer for as much money as they can while they lose your bag. And one uh, airline is dedicated to lowering the cost of air travel forevermore uh, showing that the good guys win in the end, <laughs> which will be us. <laughs> it could be. It's interesting, isn't it, that we lost fewer carriers during the pandemic than we do in the normal space of two years. That's just state aid. Well, indeed, of course, absolutely, it goes without saying. But So five years from now, do you think this will happen, or are we looking at ten years from now? No, I think it'll be faster. I think it's the next two or three years. I mean, the balance sheets of a lot of these airlines are shot to pieces. ITA has to repay state aid. TAP has to repay state aid. You know... Ultimately, and it, to be fair, having been privatised, Air France, Lufthansa, IAG are well-run airline groups. You know, they have good management teams. You know, they are, uh, I have nothing but the height of respect for them. What they do, they do well. I mean, Lufthansa has demonstrated owning uh, Brussels Airlines, owning mm. Swiss, Austrian. 
you know, they may screw up the airfares and roger everybody, but they run a very good service. It's just very expensive. But, you know, so you have much better run airlines across Europe, but the industry itself will tend towards some kind of uh, consolidation. It has in North America, and Europe is running about 10 years behind North America. Um, and we will be paying slightly higher airfares, probably paying a little bit more for our environmental taxes. Um, but you know, the idea that people will stop flying or flight shaming, or the, that's for the birds. People are going to keep flying. Young people around Europe want to travel around Europe. You have Erasmus programs. Uh, that's not, you can't put that genie back in the bottle. And it is absolutely mm -hmm. critical to the tourism industries and job creation, particularly in, many, in the regions of Europe. Portugal, Spain, the Canaries, the Balearics, Malta, Cyprus, uh, the Greek islands, that we stimulate tourism. And it's a lot of the rubbish that's talked here in Brussels about you know, penalizing air travel means penalizing tourism and job creation in the regions of Europe. But that's not good. It's not a plan that's going to fly. So I think we should be very optimistic. The future of Europe is bright. The future of air travel in Europe is in safe hands uh, because Ryanair is going to keep providing competition and choice to the uh, high fare sheriffs of Nottingham, also known as uh, Lufthansa, Air France and IAG. And we will be carrying by far, uh, by, by far away the vast majority of European passengers and doing so in cooperation with Eurocontrol, who will be continuing to improve uh, and reduce the number of delays we get uh, across Europe during the peak summer seasons. And I would hope continue to reduce the bills we have to pay for these very expensive ATC services around Europe. I couldn't think of a better you note. Know, to no, no, oh, no, we can no, finish no, no, on a better no, note. I'm sorry, before we finish, and I know we're losing the feed in about five minutes' time, I had a very witty slide presentation here for the audience, and, you know, there are three, the, the three most successful exports Ireland has ever sold. Uh, export number, the third most successful was Irish pubs in Brussels. The second most successful export to Brussels was Ryanair. Uh, but the single most successful export uh, that Ireland has sent to Brussels is without doubt uh, Mr. Eamon Brennan, uh, who has, I think, will, in the, at the end of December, complete a spectacularly successful four-year period as the uh, I think Director General of Eurocontrol. We wish, and I think it's a, an open secret, the whole industry wishes he would do a second four-year term as the, uh, the DG of Eurocontrol. Everyone but Eamon. Yeah, it was, <laughs> I, and particularly the pubs and uh, whiskey bars of, of Brussels hope he would do another four years. Uh, but I wouldn't let the occasion go, and it's not often that Reiner gives out plaudits or credits or even presentation, but we want to make a quick presentation. I want to call Eamon Brennan to the stage here where we had a whip around in Ryanair uh, and actually managed to come up with enough money to buy a crystal vase. Uh, we've also got a plinth engraved, and it says, Eamon Brennan, Eurocontrol DG, 2018 to 2022. Ireland's best in Brussels after Ryanair. Oh. <laughs> Eamon, <laughs> congratulations, <laughs> and well done. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we've actually run out of well time. Done, I'd like to... Uh, Thank, obviously, Eddie, Thank Michael you. and Neil. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I really appreciated your time. I thought it was fascinating. Uh, I think we've lost the feed, but for everyone in the room, it's great to have you back. I'm so pleased to see you. And let's give one more round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Deborah Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.